So now we will discuss the approach to a patient with young diabetes. What are the diagnostic possibilities and discuss certain case scenarios. Okay. You know, now the prevalence and uh, the sheer burden of patients with diabetes is increasing exponentially worldwide. And notably, the proportion of those who are young is also on the rise. Previously, even the type 2 diabetes, which we consider as the most common forms of diabetes, had an average age of onset after 30 years. But now it has preceded by at least a decade. And uh, we are increasingly diagnosing type 2 diabetes in individuals in their second and third decade of life. Okay, so a sound knowledge about how to approach such a patient who is presenting with hyperglycemia at a younger age and how to systematically progress and eventually reach at the diagnosis is very important for a clinician. So the young diabetes, how do you define it is actually a difficult question because various literature has different opinions. So in general, but for uh, ease of description and communication, we say that those individuals with diabetes onset before 30 years of age, 30 years of age is what we call as young diabetes. Okay. And what are the causes? Of course, you think of the more common causes like type 1 diabetes and type 2 diabetes initially. Type 1 and type 2 diabetes are the commoner ones that you think initially. And then you have the monogenic causes of diabetes. The monogenic causes of diabetes initially and certain syndromic forms. The syndromic forms like uh, the ones associated with prader willi syndrome, the barder pedal syndrome, then Alstrom syndrome. Okay, so these are all the syndromic causes. Now, what are the possibilities of a monogenic causes of diabetes? You have MODI, which is the most common monogenic form. You have the mitochondrial diabetes. A very less share could be neonatal diabetes, which is having a second appearance in the peripubertal period. You have monogenic conditions causing mutations in the insulin signaling pathway, like the lipodystrophy syndromes and all. Okay. Then you have certain monogenic syndromes that can a monogenic mutations that result in syndromic diabetes. So all these are possibilities in a patient who is having a genetic causes of diabetes. In such patients, you will have a very strong three-generational or multi-generational family history of young onset diabetes. So multi-generational family history of young onset diabetes is one of the important characteristics of monogenic diabetes. Okay. So this is again one chart which we have discussed in detail in the typing and classification of diabetes module. Whenever you are encountering a patient with diabetes, you try to answer these questions. What is the age at which the patient has presented? Whether the patient has osmotic symptoms or not? Because this would give you an idea regarding whether there is insulin deficiency or not. Only when the patient has symptomatic insulin deficiency, your osmotic symptom would kick in. That is why you usually associate in a patient with type 1 diabetes or type 2 diabetes with significant insulinopenia. Then history of decay again would be more common in patients with type 1 diabetes. Family history of DM. You know, family history of diabetes can be seen in both type 2 diabetes and in patients with monogenic diabetes. It is less common in type 1 diabetes. Body habitus. You know, type 2 would have features of insulin resistance and lipodystrophic diabetes. So insulin resistance and obesity may be seen in patients with type 2 diabetes and lipodystrophy whereas lean individuals without features of insulin resistance uh, is seen in type 1 diabetes, MODI, then uh, pancreatic diabetes etc. Okay, then C-peptide levels will be low in type 1 diabetes and in pancreatic diabetes. Because in pancreatic diabetes also there is destruction to the uh, islet of Langerhans cells part. Autoantibodies, it will be positive in type 1 diabetes, negative in all other cases. Then you have certain extra pancreatic features which will give you specific clue regarding the underlying etiology. 
So we are moving on to the first case. This is a 16 year old male with osmotic symptoms for two weeks. So what will the osmotic symptoms indicate? Likely insulinopenia. Insulinopenia. Blood glucose is 350. Ketones is 3 plus. This is a presentation. At presentation, ABG again acidosis with a low bicarb of 12. No family history of diabetes. And on examination, as you can see, the Patient is lean with no features of insulin resistance. The patient is underweight. Underweight. And look at the investigations. The basal investigations is unremarkable except for a, a low hemoglobin. Fasting is high. Postprandial is high. The HbA1c is also high. And look at the C-peptide level. You know, when the C-peptide is less than 0.6 nanograms per ml. Again, this is not a universally standardized cutoff. This is what one of the cutoffs that we use in practice. If the basal or fasting C peptide level is 0.6 nanogram per ml, it is suggestive of reduced endogenous insulin production. So you had all the features of insulinopenia with features of diabetic ketoacidosis, low insulin production as evidenced by decreased C peptide, and the GAD antibody is also very strongly positive. So looking at all these, is a young patient. 15 years, osmotic symptoms plus, history of DKA plus, no family history, body habit is lean, no features of insulin resistance, C-peptide is very low, autoantibody is positive, extra pancreatic features nil. So everything point towards the diagnosis of type 1 diabetes. Okay, type 1 diabetes. So in a type 1 diabetes, there is often a question when to send C-peptide. So what happens if you send C-peptide when the patient has an A1C of 14 or C blood glucose of 400 or 500? So in patients with very high blood glucose, in very high blood glucose, there will be glucotoxicity. Glucotoxicity meaning very high blood glucose would have a negative effect on beta cells of pancreas. So it would cause reduced insulin production insulin production so this high blood glucose should not be transient it has to be very high and persistent a sudden fluctuation in blood glucose a previously normal blood glucose patient suddenly having a spike will not result in glucotoxicity so very high and persistently high blood glucose would cause glucotoxicity so in such patients you will wait for Two to three weeks, two to three weeks, you normalize glucose, normalize glucose, then you check for C peptide. Very important. Then check for C peptide. So, what is the importance here? So, what is the importance here is that even in patients with type 2 diabetes and glucotoxicity, in type 2 diabetes patient untreated may also have very high blood glucose of 400s and 500s. In such patients also, if you are not controlling the blood glucose, they can have glucotoxic effects on the pancreatic beta cells resulting in low insulin production and C-peptide. So if you check C-peptide in such individuals, the C-peptide could be less than 0.6 nanogram per ml and you may be wrongly labeling it as a type 1 diabetes. That is why you should wait for 2-3 to three weeks with good glycemic control before you send the sample for C-peptide. Whereas autoantibodies it generally has no direct correlation with the glycemia who can be sent initially can be sent at diagnosis itself you need not wait for optimal glycemic control before sending autoantibodies and which are the autoantibodies to be sent the first line is the anti gad antibody anti gad antibody if you are not sure about the diabetes onset you are seeing a patient after 5 to 10 years of diagnosis and you still suspect a type 1 diabetes, which is the antibody you will send? It is the GAD antibody because it is the most persistent. Whereas in very early onset, very early onset, like less than 5 years of age, you sent anti-insulin antibody. Anti-insulin antibody in very early onset diabetes. Okay, the other antibodies include anti sing transporter 8 anti ia2a 
then insulin, islet cell antibodies, etc. So because I have touched upon the uh, type 1 diabetes, you know, this terminology, latent autoimmune diabetes in adult, which is currently called as slow, slowly evolving immune mediated, immune mediated diabetes of adults. This is the current terminology for the LADA. So LADA, you can say that this is a form of type 1 diabetes, which is mild and occurring after 30 years of age. What do you mean by mild? Mild means there is no total loss of insulin production. It is a partial loss and the patient may or may not require insulin at presentation. So the diagnostic criteria for LADA is that at least one autoantibody, predominantly the GAD has to be positive, the age of the individual has to be more than 30 and the patient should not require insulin at least for the first six months. Okay, first six months the patient should not require insulin. This is the diagnostic criteria proposed by the Immunology of Diabetes Society for LADA, which is the latent autoimmune diabetes in young. So the condition which we have discussed here is the type 1A diabetes. So what is 1A and 1B? 1A is the autoantibody positive and 1B is the autoantibody negative. Okay. So what are the other investigations that you need to send in a type 1 diabetes patient at diagnosis? So at diagnosis, because type 1 diabetes is an autoimmune disease, you check for other autoimmune conditions. Like thyroid disease, you will evaluate for TSH, say a free T4 and anti-TPO. And you may have to repeat it every 2 to 3 years if the initial test is normal. Then the celiac disease, celiac disease screening. Again, at diagnosis and every 5 years. Every 5 years if the initial test is negative. So what investigations will you do to uh, rule out the celiac disease? It is the IgA tissue transglutaminase. Transglutaminase. Okay. And uh, screening for complications in type 1 diabetes, it is done after 5 years of diagnosis. After 5 years of diagnosis. So in a children, when 5 years have elapsed or at the pubertal onset, pubertal onset or more than 10 to 11 years, whichever is earlier. So 5 years after diagnosis and at the pubertal onset or 10 to 11 years whichever is earlier. This is where when you would screen for the complications of type 1 diabetes. Okay, now we are moving on to the second case. So this is a 20 year old female. Okay, 20 year old uh, female incidentally detected hyperglycemia during a febrile illness. Very strong family history of diabetes. Young onset diabetes in father and grandfather. BMI is normal, no features of insulin resistance. So in such individuals with a very strong family history, multi-generational history of young onset diabetes, you have to think of the monogenic causes for diabetes. Okay, you know, whenever you think of monogenic cause of diabetes, MODI is the first thing that comes to your mind. Maturity onset diabetes in young. But is it always the poss likely possibility to just look at this pedigree. In this pedigree, you can see starting here in this generation. So this is, this children is involved. This is involved. No, these are involved. Okay. So if you look at this type of inheritance pattern and multi-generational young onset diabetes, and you identify that all the affected individuals are females, all the affected individuals are female, you should think of mitochondrial diabetes. So a multi-generational young onset diabetes is not always modi, is not always modi. If the affected individuals are all females, you should think of a mitochondrial diabetes as well. 
but in our case the young onset diabetes was there in father and grandfather so it is unlikely to be mitochondrial diabetes now look at the investigations the fasting is high the postprandial glucose is high the hba1c is on the higher side the ketone bodies are negative GAT 65 antibody again is negative. The C peptide is normal because it is more than 0.6 nanogram per ml. The USG abdomen is also normal.